looking at my, I, I pre, pre prepare my whole sermons for a year in advance. So back in September or October this last year, I was kind of preparing all the messages. And I was going over this stuff, and I realized, you know, here's a message today about God being in control, that Jesus has all the authority, and he's king. And I'm like, man, that is a good message. I need to hear that today. So I want to share with you what God shared with me. Can I do that? Psalm chapter 2 talks about Jesus, who is on the throne, who is king. Who's king? Now, we don't understand what it's like to, to serve under a king or live under the authority of a king because we live in a demonocracy. I'm a democracy, right? <laughs> Democracies are good if the right guys are in control, and it's awful if the wrong guys are. That's true of any government, governance, by the way. But we don't understand what a king is. A king is a person who has all the authority and what the king says go. That's just the way it is. We don't kind of understand that. We don't live in that environment, that world. But Jesus here in this psalm is described as king. And I think sometimes when we look at Jesus and our relationship to him, we kind of think of Jesus as our buddy and our friend. And, but you know what? Jesus is also our Lord, and Jesus is also our king. And so I think sometimes we lose that dimension of who Jesus is. And so I want us, what, what's great about this passage is it's connected intimately to the resurrection. And we're going to see that. We're going to see that the resurrected Jesus isn't just someone who's gave himself for us so that we can have life, which he is, who showed grace to us even when we didn't deserve it, which he does. But Jesus is also our king, and he deserves and is worthy of our service, our devotion, and our life today. So I want us to look at that. Uh, Psalm chapter 2 today, verses 6 through 12. Psalm chapter 2, verses 6 through 12, it says this, Yet I have set my king over my holy hill of Zion, and I will declare this decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten of you. Uh, ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Amen. Just see how you're taking that. Verse 10, now therefore be wise, O king, be instructed, you judges of earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in the Lord. Father, today we thank you for your word today. And God, for this picture of Jesus, who is our king today, who is sovereign, he's above all things. And Lord, you are absolutely in control of our lives. And Lord, you absolutely are the one who deserves our service, our devotion today. And God, I pray that you would speak that to the hearts of your people today. Lord, maybe we've been lackadaisical in our, in our worship, in our service of you. But God, I pray that today you'd help us to see the reality of what it means when we recognize that Jesus is our king. Help us to do that today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 2 is actually a, a, a declaration of who Jesus is and what our responsibility to him as king is. Uh, there is a connection between the resurrection and these portions of scripture as related in the New Testament. Because Jesus was uh, in the same verse um, is re repeated, it's kind of interesting. Acts 13 is kind of one of those things where Paul is preaching. He preached about Romans, I'm sorry, uh, Psalm 16, what we talked about last week, but he also talks about this particular passage in that same uh, discourse where he's trying to convert, convince people about the resurrection. He uses this passage uh, to convince people about who Jesus is. And there's a, there's a connection between the resurrection and this idea. Once Jesus was raised from the dead, he was accepted. That was the acceptance of, what, of the work of the cross. And Jesus at that time had all authority given to him. He became king. He's our king. He's our Lord. And he's our savior today. Look at verse 6. It says, yet I have set my king on my holy hill on Zion. The king is going to be ruling in the, in the area of Zion. Zion, as a word, is mentioned uh, 39 times in the Psalms. It's mentioned 39 times in the Psalms. Zion, by the way, is not just a bank in Fruitland, okay? So most people think, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the word Zion. You go, I don't even know what that means. Zion was actually, uh, the reason we have that word Zion is David came in, and there was a city called Zion, and, and David fought the Jebusites, for the city of Zion, you overtook it, and that's basically where David set up shop. And that, the city of the Je Jezebites, Jezebites became the city of Jerusalem. 
Okay? So when you think of Zion, what you're really thinking of is the city of Jerusalem. Most notably, Zion became known as the Holy Hill. The Holy Hill was the place where the temple was. Okay? So when you think of Zion, you're not just thinking of Jerusalem as a city, but, but almost always you're thinking of the Holy Hill or the place where the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was, the place where the temple was. This is the place where God's presence was. And so what you have here in this passage, at the beginning of this passage, you have, you have God setting up this king over his holy hill. In other words, God is establishing Jesus as the one who is the one who's over everything that's God's God's. That's the one who exudes the presence of God. That's who Jesus is. God set Jesus up as our king. And as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus is king of kings and he is Lord of lords. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the authority and that's who Jesus is. Jesus has been established as our king today. He's the one who has all the authority. Ephesians 1, uh, 20 and 21 says this, that God had seated him at his right hand in heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in every age to come. That's who Jesus is. He has all authority that's been given to him because he's the king. King has absolute authority. can do whatever he wants. Now, because he's the king... You know, kings have a tendency, as a king, they make decrees. A decree, by the way, is a lawful order. When a king makes a decree, it's not just saying, I would like a sandwich. You know, he's saying, he's saying I want this to be done. And if the king says, makes a decree, that whatever he said needs to be done, needs to get done. Because it's a lawful order, and there's responsibility for that. Now, there were, in this passage of Scripture, there are three decrees given about the Son. There are three to give. Three decrees given by God about Jesus, affirming his relationship and his rights. So these are the three things I want you to see, because this describes who King Jesus is. Number one, the first thing I want you to see, the first decree God makes about Jesus is that he's his son. Verse 7 says, I will, de I will declare this decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now, that verse right there, verse 7, is repeated three times in the New Testament. It's repeated once in Acts chapter, uh, chapter 13. Uh, it's also repeated in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, and Hebrews 5, verse 5. Hebrews, Acts 13, 33, Paul references this verse, it, building the idea that Jesus wasn't just a man, but he was the Son. He was the Son of God. Today have I begotten you. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, the author there is talking about Christ's superiority over the angels. And he said, which one of the angels has ever God said? You're my son. Today I have begotten you. He's talking about that relationship the son has with the father. And in Hebrews 5.5, 5, it's talking about Jesus as the high priest, again, who was elevated, not because he was of the line of Aaron, but Jesus was the son. That that's that special relationship that God has with Jesus, that he's the son. Today, the Bible, God says to him, this, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, some people would say, well, Pastor, does that mean that God ha had Jesus in that moment, that, that was, there was a moment where Jesus came to be? And I'm going to say, that's not what the Scripture is saying. That there was a moment where Jesus was, and then today, all of a sudden, now there's Jesus. I believe the Bible teaches that Jesus always was. Jesus is eternal. How do I know that? John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14 of John 1 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Can I speak it any faster? Probably. That, that, what that verse is saying is that Jesus always was. In the beginning, He was. So when we look at this passage of Scripture, it's not saying that today, all of a sudden, Jesus came into existence, but, but today is the day God is acknowledging the relationship He has with Jesus. You ever gone to a sports game and watch your kids play games? You ever watch your kids play a sports game and they're out there and, and maybe it's basketball and they're running up and down the court and they shoot a shot and they make it and you're sitting there going, hey, that's my boy, right? All of a sudden, where you acknowledge the relationship, that doesn't mean the relationship just happened. It, what it means is in that moment, you look, at your, you look at your offspring, you look at your child and, you, and that pride wells up and you say, today, that's my boy. And that's exactly what God's doing in this passage. Today, he's acknowledging Jesus is king because he's the son. 
He has the right and the authority of the king because of his relationship with the king. You guys watch all the, uh, all the uh, royal family stuff? You guys get into that? You watch that Meghan Markle, Prince Charles, Prince William? You know, everybody, everybody's really into that, isn't it? I can see all you guys in Idaho going, oh, that's so good. Right? Do you know why any of those guys have any importance? It's not because of who they are. It's because of who their father is. It's because of the relationship they have. The only reason that they're even in the news, which we kind of can live without them being in the news, right? But it, the only reason they're in the news is because of their relationship. And, and what I want you to see here is Jesus is king because of his relationship with his father, because he's the son. Secondly, the second decree is this, that he'll give the nations as an inheritance. Verse 8 says, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance at the ends of the earth for your possession. Ask of me. God is saying everything is under the authority of Jesus. All Jesus has to do is ask because that's what the, that's what the king does. He gives authority. You remember the story of Esther in the Bible? The story of Esther is Mordecai comes to Esther and says, Esther, you have to intervene for the Jewish people. And Esther's like, I can't go to the king unless he summons me. If the king doesn't summon you and I show up, he's got two options. He can extend his scepter to me, which means he'll listen to me. I can have an audience with him. Or if he doesn't do anything, then I'm toast. I'll be killed. Or put away or, you know, disappear like a mafia person in the uh, sands of Las Vegas, right? That's what's going to happen to me. So she says, I don't know if I want to do that. And and Mordecai talks, challenges her that if you're not going to do this, God's going to find someone else to do it. But maybe you've been brought to this place right now for such a time as this. So Esther decides, she prays and she fasts and she goes into the presence of the king. And the moment she goes in the presence of the king, the king extends his scepter to her, which means he's, that means she, all she can come and have an audience with the king. And, And this is what the king says to her, Esther 5, verse 5, verse 3. And the king said to her, what do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half of my kingdom. Think about that. The king has the authority to give authority over whatever the person he deems worthy to receive. Jesus has been deemed worthy by the Father to receive all authority over every person, every kingdom, every nation, every tribe, every individual on this earth falls under the authority and the jurisdiction of King Jesus. That's who Jesus is. He has the authority over everything and everyone. He has all the authority. The last decree is this, that he's going to break those rebellious nations. Now, look at verse 9. This, this, I don't know about you, but as I'm reading, I'm getting excited about King Jesus. Then you come across verse 9, and you're a little like, well, what's this? Verse 9 says, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Have you ever dropped a ceramic thing? a cup or a pot, and it's just shattered. Whoops, like my papers have all flown off. Good luck. I got to go digital. I'm just telling you. Uh, have, you ever, have you ever had that happen where you just kind of, where you just kind of, there it is, I think. There we go. I'm like, I don't even know what page I'm on anymore. My pages aren't numbered. Um, have you ever dropped something like that and it shatters and it's just all over the place? You ever done that? It's, it's like th- this picture of, of Jesus ruling with a rod of iron, it's, it seems kind of negative, right? Does it seem kind of harsh that King Jesus would just like break people up and destroy them like that, like shatter them? Well, here, here's the reality, guys. Sometimes in order for people to do what's right, there has to be consequences for the things they do wrong, okay? In order, most of us... Okay, I'm just going to get a little personal here. Most of us would not drive the speed limit if we didn't see a police car every so often. Right? Some of you are like trying not to smile. It's okay. We're all with you. Right? If you, most of us wouldn't be like, well, you know, when I was, when I was a teenager, I had a 1970 uh, Chrysler Cordova. That baby could move. I mean, you weren't, driving 55 in a Chrysler Cordova is like driving 25 in most other cars. You feel like you're really going slow. And I remember that baby, when I was going 70 miles an hour, and back then it wasn't, that wasn't the speed limit. But I was only 18, so you can't be too upset at me. I, I just remember driving around and going, man, this feels really good, you know? But, 
All of us, if there wasn't someone enforcing the law, if there wasn't someone there who there weren't consequences for breaking law, most of us would probably just break the law. Because without consequences, we, in our, own, in our own heart, we won't do the right thing. Sometimes there has to be consequences that check us to help us not do the wrong thing. The, just to give you some statistics, this last year, this last year, most, most people stayed home last year, right? Most people were in their houses locked down because of COVID last year. But in the larger cities, there was a 20% increase in the murder rate last year. Now, what may surprise you is there was a 30% murder rate, in, there's a um, 30% murder rate increase in the smaller cities as well. And so I was thinking about that. I was thinking about all the crime statistics are going up. Have you noticed that? They've been talking about it. Occasionally, they'll talk about it on the news. Not very much. But, but the reality is crime is going up. And so you have to ask yourself, well, why is that? Why is it? I believe the reason that crime is going up today is because people have no fear of authority. They have no fear of the consequences. And if there's no fear of the authority, and there's no fear of the consequences, in other words, they think, I can do this, and then nothing will happen to me, what's going to stop them from doing it? Are you going to trust the moral fiber of that person to, to, to believe, I'm not going to do that? No, they're just going to do what's wrong because they can get away with it. In, in Portland, Portland is a great example, by the way. In Portland, Oregon, right now, if you get arrested, there's a really good chance you're going to get released on the same day that you're arrested. They're just, as a matter of fact, some police in Portland have stopped arresting people because they don't see the benefit in it. What's the point? They're just going to get released anyway. Now, can I tell you what the Bible says about this? Ecclesiastes 8.11. You should write this one down. I'm just telling you, this is something that to me gave me understanding about the need for a little consequence in the lives of people. Eight, uh, Ecclesiastes 8.11 says this, when a crime is not punished quickly, people feel it is safe to do wrong. When a crime is not punished quickly, people feel safe to do what's wrong. Doesn't that make sense? Like if I'm, not, if it, if I'm gonna do it and nothing's gonna happen to me, well, then I'm gonna do it again and I'm gonna do it again. Because nothing's going to happen to me. And they'll keep doing more wrong. Until someone comes in today to the cities or to the smaller cities and says, look, there's consequences for these actions. Until that happens, people are going to do what's wicked. Now, you look at the verse in the context of King Jesus, and you have to realize, why is Jesus dashing people with iron? Because sometimes it's that threat of consequence that keeps us on the right path, that helps us do the right thing. It's not because Jesus is out there waiting, going, I can't wait to use this rod. Ooh, come on, boys and girls. Step across that line, kiddos. That's not what Jesus is doing. Sometimes, without, that, without the threat of consequence, we won't do the right thing. I, I, human nature is sinful, not good. That means all of us are prone to sin, doing the wrong thing. And what the Scripture says is that there has to be consequences for you to say, okay, I'm not going to do the wrong thing. I'm going to do the right thing. Okay, so fear is actually a good thing. You have to give an account of your life someday to Jesus. I want you to recognize something, that someday everyone in this room is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us are have, going to have to give an account to Jesus one day. Se, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things that he's done in his body according to what he's done, whether it's good or bad. Everybody's going to stand before Jesus someday. All of us are going to have to give an account to the Lord. By the way, that's why I believe people fear death innately. It's not because it's necessarily just the unknown. I think they recognize internally that they're going to have to give an account for their life, and they're not ready to do that. The only way you're ready to give an account for your life is if you have a relationship with Jesus. Because the blood of Jesus Christ covers all of your sin. And so that's the only way you're prepared to enter into the next life. So if you want, to be, you want to be ready to give that account for Jesus, you have to have a relationship with him. And when you have a relationship with him, there's no problem in giving an account because he covered your sins. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, well, you got a lot to answer for. Because we've all done some things that we all regret. And without the blood of Christ covering us from our sin, we have to give that account. So I'm telling you, if you want to be ready, know Jesus. So, all these decrees, the decree of relationship, the decree of consequence, all these things have been given. Now, what's our response then to our King Jesus? There are four responses that you and I should have because we understand who Jesus is and why he's doing the things that he's doing. Number one, the first consequence is this. 
I'm sorry, the first response is this. We need to serve the Lord with fear. Our first responsibility to Jesus is to serve him. Okay? Uh, today, a lot of times in churches, people talk about knowing Jesus, and that's only our responsibility. But our responsibility as Christians is not just to have a relationship with Jesus, but our responsibility as Christians is to serve Jesus. God was, doesn't just want us to say, yeah, I know him. Do you realize the Bible says that even the demons believe and tremble? They know who Jesus is. They know him. They know all about Jesus. But that's not, that's not what our job is. Our job isn't just to know Jesus. Our job is to serve him. Jesus said this in John 12, 26. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. Then the Father will honor anyone who serves me. God wants us as Christians to follow and be obedient to the things that Jesus has told us to do. He doesn't want us just to say, I'm a, fo I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm not doing what he says. He wants us to be people who serve the Lord. In your heart today, what I want you to do is I want you to evaluate, am I really serving Jesus? Am I, am I giving Jesus my life? Am I doing the things that God wants me to do? And I want to challenge you, if you're not, it's time to step up your service to the Lord. Don't, don't get down on yourself saying, oh, I should have done more. God's asking you to step up your service to the Lord. The second thing that we respond when we understand Jesus is our king is that we need to rejoice in the Lord. You know, there's joy in serving the Lord. I could tell you this from personal experience, there's joy in knowing and serving Jesus. But what's interesting about this, they add a little, little, kind of a little tidbit that rejoice in the Lord with trembling. How can you have joy and fear at the same time? Show me the joy fear faces like this. You know what I mean? How, what's that face look like? The joy, I got a little joy, a little fear. You know, what's that look like? I haven't mastered that face. I tried, I tried to figure out what that looked like. Um, but here's, here's what I want you to see. I want you to understand. In the Lord's, in following the Lord, having a relationship with him, there's joy in serving the Lord, but there's only joy in the boundaries that God has for you. When, when Tan and I moved to Payette, we got our house, and our house has a fence all the way around it in the backyard. And we were so excited about the fence. Do you know why? Because we could let the kids play in the boundary of the fence. We had a swing set back there. They had toys, a little sandbox where the cats and them played together. Understand that? Daddy, what's this Tootsie Roll doing? Put that down. Put that down. You know what I'm talking about. You sit, you let the kids play, and they have so much fun in the boundaries of the backyard. But the moment they went out of the front yard, there was no fence, and the street, and the street was there, and cars were there. There was danger in the front yard, but there was joy in the back. Guys, let me tell you something. In the Lord's, in the Lord's economy of your life, there's a lot of joy in the boundaries that he set for you. And when you get in trouble is when you step across or outside those boundaries. So as long as you stay in the field of play, God has given us so many things richly in this life to enjoy, but our tendency is to step out of what God wants us to enjoy into the things that we want to enjoy or we think are beneficial, we think are good, and those are the things that hurt us. There is joy in the boundary. That's why we can rejoice in the Lord in the boundaries because that's why we can have trembling. Step out of that safety net, you put yourself into situations. Number three, third responsibility, is to submit or kiss the sun. Kiss the sun. This, by the way, is one of the new favorite verses for some of our young girls. Hey, look what the Bible says. I can kiss the sun. Kiss the sun is, by the way, is a sign of submission and respect. It's not just a, an affection thing. It's not just a dating thing. This is a sign of affection uh, a sign of submission. Uh, it, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, when, when Samuel anointed Saul as king, one of the things he did after he poured, the, poured the, the oil on him is that Saul actually kissed him. Because now Saul was the prophet, by the way. He was the man of God. And when he kissed, uh, when Samuel kissed Saul, what he was doing was submitting to his leadership. Submitting to him. That's a sign of submission. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, uh, Elijah is complaining to the Lord about how nobody, nobody but him is following Jesus. Have you ever, or no one else but him is following the Lord? Have you ever felt like you're the only one following the Lord and everyone else is getting away with stuff? Elijah felt like that. And he's like, Lord, I'm just so, I'm the only one. And God said, there's, there's these, there's, uh, in verse uh, 18, 19 verse 18, he said, there are uh, uh, 7,000 people in Israel who have not bowed the knee. 7,000 people. And he said, they, they have bowed the knee to Baal or kissed him. 
kissed him. In other words, that same picture of submitting themselves to him. Guys, listen, part of being a believer in Jesus means you're submitted your life to his Lord, leading and his lordship. I'm going wherever God wants me to go. I'm doing whatever God wants me to do. Do you realize that? That my life is not my own because I'm submitted to him. He's the guy in charge. I'm just the guy who's carrying out the orders. That's what God wants us to do. We need to submit ourselves because he is the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Salvation, Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, Salvation is not found in anyone else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. The only way to God is through Jesus, and we need to submit ourselves to him. That's what God wants us to do. So we need to be submitted to the Lord. I'm getting pretty good at that. I'm going to catch that thing yet. All right. Lastly, last responsibility is this. Put your trust in him. There is a blessing when we place our trust in the Lord. When you actually say, God, I'm going to trust you with my life. I'm going to trust you with who I am. There's a blessing that comes from that. It's almost a repeat of Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1 says this. It says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that send out its roots by the stream. So when you place your trust in the Lord, the picture of that is this great tree that has its roots established and growing. In other words, life is coming through those roots, the water, the life is coming there. Everything that you hope for in this life, the blessing that you need in this life, the, to flourish and to grow in this life, all comes from your relationship with God. If you have a right relationship with God, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. You're going to have everything that you need in this life. Your responsibility to the king is to trust him. And so today, well, I want to ask you a couple questions. Are you serving and submitted to Jesus? Are you serving God and rejoicing in the boundaries that God has for you? Or have you decided to kind of cross off a few boundaries and take a step outside because it's not worth it? And are you really trusting in the Lord today? Or does God need to, is God trying to say that you need to really place your trust and belief and faith in him? Let's pray. Father, today we thank you for your word today that I believe is so relevant to each and every one of us. It's relevant to me. And so, Lord, today we want to acknowledge Jesus as the king, the one who's been established by the Father over every man, woman, child, over everything that, that's happening on planet Earth today. Lord, you're the king today. We acknowledge that today. And God, I pray that you'd help us to understand that you've made Jesus king through decree. You've made Jesus the one who establishes consequences today. Father God, we want to understand that we have a response to you. We, because you're king, Lord, we as a people today need to respond to you. We need to submit ourselves wholly to you. Not just in part, but in whole. I, there's not a part of my life, Jesus, that you're not Lord over today. And God, I want to give you every area of my life today. I want to be completely and wholly submitted to the one who gave himself for me today. With every head bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you a couple questions. Number one, I want to ask you, are you in a right relationship with the one that someday you'll have to stand before and give an account? Because if you're not in a right place with him today, let me tell you something. You're not promised tomorrow. You may not have tomorrow to get your life right. Today might be your day. The Bible says this, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. If you have an opportunity to make your heart right with Jesus today, today is the right day that you should do that. And so as you're, as you're thinking about giving an account before the Lord today, are you ready to stand before him, give an account? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Have your sins been forgiven? If they haven't been, or you're not living in a right, in right relationship with the Lord, then today is the day you start afresh and new and reclaim that right relationship with Jesus today. If you want to have that right relationship with Jesus today, just raise your hand wherever you are this morning. If that's you, we want to give you that opportunity today. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Father, today we want to pause and pray for those people who say, you know, Pastor, I want to have that right relationship with Jesus today. I want to submit to the one who gave himself for me today. I want to find forgiveness from the, from the sins I've committed in my life. I want to find that forgiveness today. And Lord, we thank you that the scripture tells us that when we confess our sins, Jesus is so faithful to forgive us all our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness today. Thank you, Lord, for that. There are others today that I just want to ask if you're here today. Have you really submitted every area of your life to the Lordship of Jesus? Is he really your king? 
You see, do you really see him as the one who rules over your life? Or is there an area of your life that you said, Jesus, you can't have this area. I, 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 this is my thing. This is what I want to do. Today, God is challenging you to view him as king today and surrender every area of your life to him. Surrender yourself wholly to the one who has all the authority over your life. If God is speaking to your life about an area that you need to surrender to him with every head bowed and eyes closed, you say, raise your hand and say, Pastor, God's speaking to me about an area of my life. I need to surrender to Jesus today. If that's you, just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm telling you, sometimes in our lives, we, we allow, we kind, of, we kind of wall off areas of our heart and say, no, that's mine. That's my area. I'm going to do what I want instead of submitting ourselves to the Lord. So, Lord, today, I pray, Lord, for all the people that raised their hand today, God, that you'd speak life to them. Father God, that you would show them that, Lord, we need to be completely, totally, 100% submitted to your hand today. God, I pray that you would guide us, you would direct us, you would help us to understand that we need to be surrendered to you wholly today. Father God, not any area of our life held back. We want to be totally submitted to the one who gave himself for us, the one who has all the authority over us today as our King and our Lord. So God, we submit ourselves to your hand today. God, we choose to be obedient to you. We choose to follow your direction today because, Lord, that's what you want your people to do. Thank you, Father, for speaking to our hearts and our lives. God, continue to speak to us throughout the rest of this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of River Life this morning. If you need to go, you can be dismissed. If you want to hang out, you can do that as well. God bless you. Have a great, great day today.